welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm Justin, joined by my co-host, Mitch. And today we have a very special guest, the man, the myth, the legend, the Grim Reaper, Mr. Steve Grimmett. Steve, how the hell are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, yeah. Uh, COVID, obviously, uh, uh, st- staying out of trouble with that. But yeah, apart from that, really good, thank you. And oh, yeah. what about you guys? How are you all good doing? Well, you know, today's election day, so we're just kind of, we're just waiting until it's over and just, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) it's rough, you know, it's an interesting day to be talking, actually, there's a lot of shit Yeah, absolutely, yeah, because, because I understand that, uh, well, one of the things that that Donald Trump said was that uh, he wants to stop the voting being counted to stop losing, I'm like, fucking pack it in, stop being a fucking child. Yeah. (laughs) But I'm, I'm not surprised at anything at this point, you know. And you know, if no, he gets exactly. his way, he's he's not in the lead right now. So I mean, that's kind of detrimental. No, I know. To him, so. Yeah, absolutely. He's definitely not in the lead, and he, I mean, he's not losing by a lot, but you know, it's he, he's still losing. Yeah. Uh, Everyone's nervous yeah. on each side, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know whether the guy. I mean. Forget his comments and all that sort of stuff. I, I'm not absolutely sure whether the guy has done a great job for America. And I'm not quite sure. That's, but, a, that's, a, that's a debate to have. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay, so, okay. Let's forget the politics. Yeah, look, we, we could talk about this for two hours. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So when, in, all right, so when in, in your life did you learn that you had these pipes? Did you just stub your toe one day, shriek, and you burst every glass in your mom's cabinet or something? <laughs> no, actually, it was a, a girlfriend I mean, I used to enjoy singing in my bedroom, you know, like that's how most guitarists start. But um, it, my girlfriend came over one day and she caught me singing in my bedroom. She says, you've got a really great voice. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, about, about two weeks later, she got me an audition in a local band. And, and basically, I've, I've not looked back since because I did find out I could sing. And then I got uh, a a band together called Medusa Mm -hmm. with a a few of her friends and the guitarist was a big priest fan. And he said, I want to do a priest number. And I I listened to it. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, Anyway, I did it. And I found out I could sing up, up in the, in the attic as well, you know? So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite good. Actually. It was just a discovery because like I said, I've not, I've, I've, I've never had any, training or anything and never wow not once have i done that so so it was never like a i, I want to be a singer type deal it was just kind of uh, not necessarily no, thrown into, on you yeah 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 i just sort of fell into it and um uh, the first time we we had a, a thing called the abc cinemas over here and mm. uh they've now gone but on a saturday morning they they had the abc minors so all the kids got to go in and watch whatever cartoons and stuff like that and we did our first show i ever did was in on that in that situation so it was all kids and it's like i've never been so nervous in my whole life you know um apart from when we did um at sexus jam in 87 Oh man, that was eighty three thousand people in front of you, and it was just oh. like, oh, you know. But yeah, so it was good, and it has been good, and it's been good to me. Uh, I haven't made any money at it, but I don't think I was given these pipes, like you say, for any for any other reason than to pleasure other people, you know. And I I really enjoy doing it. That you have done. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you remember the Judas Priest song? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, it's a really obscure one. Um, I'll think about it. And I, but gotcha. I can't. Uh, no, I can't remember it. For, uh, no, can't remember it. So what were some of your musical inspirations when you were growing up? What did you listen to? Uh, well, my, my the biggest inspiration, uh, and not many people will know this, is Elton John. Wow. I, uh, I really liked all of his stuff from day one. 
and uh, and it's only been in the last sort of couple of years I actually found out that I'm very distantly related to him as well. So, really? so yeah, so um, but yeah, he's the main reason. And then when I got with this this band that my girlfriend got me a job in, um, I um, uh, started listening to obviously rock. But it, the first thing I started listening to was um, uh, Thin Lizzy, and basically that, that's where it started. It was just like you know when you go to a, a the first Grand Prix Formula One race track and you hear those cars it just does something to you and it and that's what it did for me so once upon a time you guys were in a battle of the bands uh were you yep. confident going into that night and do you remember any of the other bands uh i don't remember any other any of the other bands but remembering some i, I certainly remember thinking wow well, they're really good you know and, and there's no way we're gonna beat them but uh, we had hell of a crowd with us that particular night. And uh, it was one of the um, judges was Roy Wood. And uh, he, he really liked the band. And, <laughs> but basically, that, that's, I, I told Nick, you know, I'd never, ever, ever do this again. Because I was so, it was awful. It was an awful thing to do. But yeah, we won it. And it was, uh, it was something else. <laughs> it really was great. <laughs> I, I imagine that was pretty crazy. I think I jumped too far ahead. How did how did you meet Nick and how did Grim Reaper form? Well, uh, we I've known I've known Nick for a long time uh, because Grim Reaper was was going as a band before uh, I joined, mm -hmm. and um, uh, he. And I'd seen them several times and he'd seen me several times because uh, I was in a band called Medusa at the time. And then I got this phone call from him and he was totally shit faced. And he didn't really say anything to me, you know, apart from this drunken bravado. And he phoned me back the next day. He said, look, I'm really sorry, you know, but I was absolutely shit faced and didn't say what I wanted to say and he basically said look I want to start uh, I want to I'm going to get rid of everybody in the band and I'm going to start with you I'd love love to you to sing with me and uh so I was like right great okay yeah fine because they they, they were a, a great band you know and it, a, a different direction from from what I was doing although I was still doing rock but um mm. it was uh uh, and we had a number of years of really good fun and it was yeah. it was great you know and uh things started looking up for us straight away from from that point onwards and uh that was it, it was a good ride you know it was, it was great and it was it's a shame it all had to come to an end but yeah. uh hopefully i'm still keeping things alive by doing what i'm doing most definitely. Once you guys got signed and started touring, how what was that adjustment like for you initially? Life on the road and <laughs> playing live. Uh, it, it was it. It obviously was an awful lot more different from anything that I'd c come across, and uh, it was uh, it wasn't difficult to do. You know, apart from we were playing every night which is what we wanted to do anyway mm -hmm. um and uh, obviously we we got to do that and meet loads of girls at the same time you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah was, so yeah it was good was there much of a difference between uh your first u.s tour and touring in the uk that you remember well we didn't really tour in the uk and and to be perfectly honest with you i still don't um <laughs> america uh, warm to us entirely, I got to say, uh, than the Brits did. Although we uh, are remembered in this country, but still not anywhere near uh, like we are in the states. I mean, I can come out there and do seven, eight week tour in the states. Yeah, I couldn't do, I couldn't do three or four gigs in a row here because people won't get off their ass uh, and come out and see bands anymore. So it's, uh, and, and likewise, that's the same for, for uh, you guys coming here. I, I've, I 
don't know if you know, but I did a session with, or, or a tour with uh, the three tremors. And uh, uh, in Europe, it was great. This country, absolute rubbish. It was terrible. Uh, and I felt sorry for him, actually, the first time when I did the show, when I, yeah, when I was part of the, the, the show. Um, and then they came back and did a, a European tour with more shows in England. And uh, I went to see them on a fairly local one. And uh, there might have been 10 people in there. And it's just like, wow. what? It's, and, and that's, that's rubbish. It's, 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 you know, the scene over here is, is really bad. I but never would have guessed else, that. Yeah, no, everywhere else, it's really good. Why do you think that is? I mean, that's your hometown crowd. They just, yeah, you'd think I don't know. More supportive. I've no idea. I, I really can't tell you why. Uh, you know, I, I tried thinking about it because I, I would love to put on a, uh, sort of a three or four band tour. Right. And, uh, but there's no point because people won't come and see us. They, they just won't get off their asses. You know, and it's not, the, in the 80s, that was never the case. We used to, uh, and I always uh, go on about this particular uh, venue. We, we played, we used to play a venue called, um, oh, that's just it gone from my head. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> it does, the story, you don't need to know where it was. <laughs> and uh, uh, Worm, Wormlow Village Hall, that's what it was called. And uh, it was an old, it was built in the early 30s, mm. big ballroom. And uh, uh, my guitarist Ian's band used to rehearse in there. And then it got to a point, it was just like, well, why don't we do a gig here? And, and I'm not kidding you, it was in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of nowhere. And put a gig on there'd be 80 or 90 cars outside so you know double that yeah. at least yeah. uh, and more and um it was a real popular venue for a long time uh, reaper played there uh, then uh, lots of other sort of biggish local bands played there then saxon came and played there then wow. motorhead and it, it just exploded but wow. if if i put a gig on there now I wouldn't get anybody through the door. You know, I think a lot of that may have to do with uh, the rise of technology, unfortunately, you know, because if you think about the 80s and those times, people really, you know, there's you, people aren't sitting at home looking at their phones. There's not a thousand channels on the television and there's not that much yep. to consume. Yeah. Now you yeah. can't get anybody to go anywhere because they can just stream it on Spotify or YouTube or sit yeah. in their house and watch yeah. it on the fucking computer screen. Yeah. I, I guarantee yeah. you, if you come over here, we'll come see it. Oh, yeah. I'm well, <laughs> it will I should be have there. been there now. I should have actually been there on tour now. We just cancelled the tour uh, because of COVID-19. Right, right. Yeah. But uh, we are, we're looking, uh, provided, because we're just about to go, or tomorrow we go into another lockdown for a mm -hmm. month. And, uh, but providing... Um, everything works out. I'm actually going to start in October 21 in uh, Mexico and um, uh, South America. Oh, and then in March 2022, we're going to do another US tour. Great. That's um, great to hear. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I was, I was worried about uh, cancelling the tour and then I cancelled it my, my agent suggested I did that and then I was thinking I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake and, uh, and I'd phone him up and he said look man you haven't made a mistake I don't and, think uh, so either and, no, yeah, no I don't I mean, you know I'm I'm, uh, I'm diabetic and I, some of the medication I take actually make me uh, more vulnerable to it so it's like Right. Okay. I did make the right choice, oh, and yeah. that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and until such times as there's a cure out there, that that's what I'm going to do. But I'm thinking that 20, 2022, sort of March, 
uh, early April is is I think we're going to get this thing beaten by. I'll, I'll be looking forward to that. Yes, me too. <laughs> yeah, no, it's about it's about time that we get live music back. So all these years later, what's your opinion on the Beavis and Butthead segments? Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that is, I'm going to be honest, that is where I first found out about the band was from the Beavis right. and Butthead segments. Well, no, that's great because we we thought obviously we didn't know, but then people started saying. Have you seen yourselves on Beavis and Butthead? They're really giving you a fucking hard time. And I'm like, uh, no, I haven't. And Nick hadn't either. And then we finally got to see the See You in Hell one. And mm-hmm. they ribbed the shit out of us. They, you know? And that was okay. And I, it didn't really bother me. But, you know, because there's two ways you can look at it. You can really be pissed off about it. Or you can like the fact that somebody likes you enough to put, the, put you on TV. Yeah, and it's just satire. Uh, I mean, yeah, and I, I, I still receive royalties from that, you know, because Beavis and Butthead are like really popular in the UK too. And I call my friend, "Have you seen yourself on Beavis and Butthead?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and we really liked it. And then uh, I, I, for the life of me, I, I, I've got a terrible memory. I, uh, I can't remember the uh, the actual producer's name or the guy that wrote it. But we actually met up, and he thought we were going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, man, no, we're not. We we are so pleased that you did it. It was great, you know. And I don't know if you've checked, or if you check it out, we are the only band that have ever had all of their videos put on Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> we had all all three albums put on there. So uh, yeah, it was a good thing. And like I say, you know, I still earn money out of it, so it's okay. Thank you. Okay, wouldn't that be? A... <laughs> it, opened, it opened you guys up up to a whole new audience. So yeah, you know, well, people and, got exposed and, to it. Yeah, and MTV, of course, because uh, back, it, oh, I think, it, yeah, it was see you in hell. Uh, they um, headbangers ball, right? Yeah, headbangers ball. They played uh, they played see you in hell. And they were only ever going to play it once. And they put a questionnaire after it. And it is saying or asking, is this, do you want to see more of this on MTV? And they got so inundated with yes, please, that we ended up on a maximum rotation seven times a day, seven days a week for seven weeks. And that's, you know, that was brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. So, Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we we and because of that, Beavis and Part it, you know, we we <laughs> we've done okay. <laughs> you brought it up, so I'm gonna go ahead and stay there. Uh, the Headbangers yeah. Ball Show is one of the yeah. biggest ones because you got that. I don't know, it's like a 50 second scream at the end. So yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. your that's your money shot there. So how, yeah, that was, how did yeah. you even um, learn you could do that? You're like, I'm gonna try to do this for a minute straight, and you just belt it. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it was it was it was trickery as well as doing it, but um, it, it it was I had the lungs from hell back then. I still <laughs> got it. I still got it, but it's not quite as as the lungs are shrinking. I think. But I mean, I can still sing all of that stuff. Um, I have to ease back a tad, like I did uh, back in the day. I mean, in actual fact, I think my vocals uh, are stronger these days because uh, back in the day, I could only manage four shows on the trot and then had to have a day off and then, uh, you know, go on for another three days and a day off. Now, I think the, the... most I've ever sung now, up to this point, have been nine shows in one hit, and um, and the day off was a travel day, so it's not really a, a catch it's up, a nod, sleep, yeah. and all that. It's, that. Yeah, it's, it's not a day off, but yeah. So you know, I think in all due respect, my my uh, vocals are stronger these days, but uh, uh, yeah, you just have to you just yeah, you have to take care of yourself, you know. You really do. Simple as that. There's a pretty big gap in between uh, the year when you guys parted ways and yeah. then you resurrected uh, the name with Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper in yeah. 2006. Yeah. So what happened yeah. in 2006 that sparked your... We we did a, a 
festival called Keep It True in Germany. Uh, and if ever you guys get the opportunity to go to it, go to that's it. That's a dream it's, show for me. I, I want to get to Keep It True. Now. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It really is awesome. It's held in a, a sports arena. Oh, it's, you can't really say it's an arena, but because it's... Like a gymnasium. I think, is it, uh, yeah, a big gymnasium, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yes, it would be mm -hmm. right, yeah. And uh, we, we went along and did it. We got asked to do Grim Reaper. Um, and uh, I've been watching other bands. I mean, this the, the whole hall... Ha had, it had t-shirt sales and also merch sales and all mm -hmm. sorts inside it and then you've got uh, like um, a balcony running down either side and I'd been watching all the bands before us and there weren't really many people in there and I thought well this is probably a waste of time and at that particular point I was ready to to quit it all and uh, then it was our turn and uh, we were all behind all the curtains and stuff. And, uh, and I thought, I'll just take a quick peek out. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I peeked out. I couldn't believe it. This place was absolutely rammed <laughs> from front to back. All the balconies were full up. And I thought, oh, OK. We did the show. <laughs> we did the show, which was a, an amazing show. And from that, that point on, basically, it was like, uh, I think there's something in this, guys, and I, and I think we ought to carry on. And so we did. And then another, then an album came, and then another one, and and just things have got bigger and bigger and bigger. And and you know, I play more places now uh, than I ever have done, because mm. back in the day it was only the states, but now it's the states, it's Europe, it's uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Never got to do any of those places. Oh, and South America. Never got to do any of those places back in the day. So, uh, you know, the whole world has opened up to us. And it's, uh, uh, to be quite honest, it's really great. That's a benefit of technology. You know, more people can uh, watch yeah. Grim Reaper videos, yeah, we, too, because of the yeah. YouTube and such. Yeah, we yeah. touched on it earlier that, you know, nobody really wants to leave and consume things. But on the, the yeah. opposite side of that is is yeah. you've got a much easier chance of newer people discovering your music. and Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, but, you know, back in the day, the only way of, of reaching out to people were magazines and circus uh, and, and magazines like that. And, and you now, I have more control at my fingertips than they ever had. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll put, well, actually at the moment, I'm not really putting a lot out, but I am just slowly tickling at it really um i got i'm fairly busy with grim reaper stuff at the moment uh and um uh, writing a new album uh i'm mixing a, a live one uh and i've also got a, a, a few bands in my studio as well so i'm fairly busy at the moment but uh uh i still can't wait to get back on the road I notice you're doing a lot of uh, YouTube collaborations too, of doing uh, covers. Yeah, those are yeah. cool. Yeah, because that's a bit of those. fun. Yeah, it's a bit of fun. Uh, we've got another one coming out shortly, um, and I think we've got the drums done for two more. So uh, keep those coming. Think... I love watching those. Like just watching yeah, you guys great. perform. Yeah, they're a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are, and as we say, they are a ton of fun. They really are, and that's that's all they're supposed to be. And, yeah, uh, yeah, they are. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so know, artistic. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, right, no, go carry on. How how would you say that your rendition of Grim Reaper when you started your own Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper? How does that? Yeah. How are you different from the original line of uh, art music? Uh, like, if any, if you tried to go a little, not really anything because. Ian, my guitarist, he he's sort of a student of Nick's uh, and he'd worked and collaborated with Nick on a lot of things. So he knew exactly how things had to go. And when we we wrote uh, the, the follow on album, the fourth one, um, he he just said, look, it's got to be Grim Reaper, you know, and I've got to play like Nick. And and he did, you know, and it's great, you know. So basically, it was, it was really the fourth album, but uh, 
and then uh, at the gates was a, it was a slight departure from that, and uh, and maybe the next one would be a bit more of a departure. And you know? so I don't I don't necessarily think we need we need to stick with the Grim Reaper stuff anymore, you know, or stick to it, you know, because right. it's there. It's, you can still listen to that, and we still play most of it live. Yeah, you've earned your right to experiment a little. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the events in Ecuador that ultimately lead led to your leg being amputated. Yeah. They, those events have always seemed insane and suspicious. You weren't able to call anybody. Uh, oh, no. It well, that, it wasn't. It uh, basically, uh, I had a, a an ulcer on the bottom of my foot. And we, we did 10 dates. The first 10 days were in um, Mexico and the water's not very good out there. And basically that's where I picked up an infection. And uh, by the time we got to Ecuador, we did Quito and uh, then we got to Guayaquil and Guayaquil, I was in agony, absolute agony. I could hardly walk or anything. And uh, I got a doctor in to the, to the hotel room and he shot me full of drugs, did what he could with with whatever was going on the bottom of my foot because I, I didn't ever see it. And uh, I did the show, uh, but I knew there was something wrong because most of the show I had to sit down. Um, and the doctor actually came to the show. And because I, I don't know whether you know or not, but every show we do, we always take care of the fans. You know, we, we all towel down quickly and then go out, take photographs, sign stuff and all that, uh, and do a general meet and greet with everybody. And I did that that night as well. And the doctor stood by the side of me and he keeps looking at his watch, you know, and after an hour he said, okay, that's it. We're going to the hospital. Mm. And when you go into hospital in Guayaquil, you can't take anything with you. You know, your phone, nothing, because it's not guaranteed that it'll be there if you have to go out of your room or whatever, you know. So uh, that's why I couldn't call anybody. Um, eventually, I persuaded them to let me have my phone back. And then that's when I called my wife and told her exactly what was going on. But by that time, I contacted her. It had all happened, you know. The, mm -hmm. I'd had three operations by then. And... Uh, it was um, it was all over and done with, as they say. The, the first operation, they cut my foot to pieces to see if they could get rid of the infection. Um, and I think five days after that, they removed all the dressing. And I actually saw my foot and thought, yeah, I do not want that on the bottom of my leg anymore. Mm. It was horrible. And so they took me below knee which would have been fantastic to learn to walk again because pretty much you can put a prosthetic on and away you go. Uh, but uh, so around five or six days again, um, they moved me in bed and it was absolute agony. And they took the dressings off and basically found that I'd got necrosis in the cup and that flesh-eating disease. So they had to take me above me. Um, which I sort of accepted most of that. Well, all of it, in fact, but the worst bit was um, uh, every operation I had, they, uh, I was awake for, for it all. They had, they just gave me an epidural. So I couldn't feel it, but I could hear them soaring through my bones, you know, with oh the old God. hand saws nope. and shit. Yeah. That. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. It was, uh, that was, especially when they took me above knee, because your, your femur's quite large. And uh, uh, they started sore. It got the sore stuck in it twice. And I'm just like digging so fucking deep to get through it. I couldn't feel it, but it oh, was yeah, just man. like, shit me. And then I had two operations after that because uh, they put a, uh, a drain in it. And yeah. they had to clean the drain twice. But they knocked me out for those. <laughs> What the fuck? The guy that had the first couple times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I probably wouldn't have ended up with PTSD, you know, if they had done that. But yeah, there you go. But yeah, it was, it, I sort of accepted it. And 
uh, spent most of my time once I'd got my phone back on the fact that, well, I had half an hour's internet every day free. That was all I had. So it was like, I spent sort of 20 minutes talking to my family in rotation and the other 10 minutes finding out how I could basically get on stage and do what I do. And uh, so I, I also looked up how I can drive a car left footed, and all that sort of stuff so i found all that out found out about prosthetics and then uh, when i got back i had to spend another two weeks in a uk hospital and then everything started and it, it seemed to to take a while for everything to happen especially with modifying my house and stuff like that but the the prosthetic took fairly it was fairly quickly and uh, my uh recovery team in in uh, swindon in the uk they said to me right where do you want to go because you can go to bristol or you can go to oxfordshire or oxford and uh, they said we suggest you go to oxford and i was like okay fine so that's where i went and uh, i think i was due to go in there within two months or something like that but I got a phone call about three weeks after waiting and they said, we've got a slot open tomorrow. Do you want to come in? I was like, yes, of course. So went in, got measured up, got told what to expect, what to do. Da, 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 da. And then the following week I went in and I'd got my leg, uh, took it home, wasn't allowed to walk in it, but could practice putting it on. And then uh, the following week I was in a rehab uh, learning how to walk again. Um, uh, it's a lot more difficult and especially as I'm getting on in years as well It's because uh, it takes a lot more energy to walk it's about 40% more energy to, to walk than, uh, uh, than it does normally and of course then you're also thinking about walking which you've never done in your life before and it was like uh, trying to walk with a leg you could feel and one you couldn't and it was, it did my head in for about uh, two weeks. I couldn't, couldn't get on with it. I couldn't put one step in front of the other. And then had a bit of an epiphany at home and uh, disregarded what the uh, rehab people said, put the leg on, started walking indoors. And it was just like, that's it, I'm off. <laughs> and six months after that, or six months actually after losing my leg, I was back on stage in Germany. So that's, that's insane. It was, yeah, it was insane, but it, it was what I wanted. I, what, that's really what I wanted to do. Uh, I hadn't finished. Uh, it was a, just a bit of an embuggerance, really. But uh, I got on and did it. And oh, I've done so many uh, three, three tours since. It's obviously a lot harder work now. Yeah. But it's, uh, you just have to prepare a bit. Um, before you go out, strengthen all your body parts, and uh, you're away then. What's what was the time like from when you noticed there was something on your foot to them cutting you above the knee? How what how long was that? Um, well, I I, I I I think it was a few months before I went on tour to the South American tour uh, that I had this diabetic ulcer on the bottom of my foot, um, but I gone to hospital had it treated and spent months uh, or one day a week for months uh, getting it uh, looked at and sorted and I thought and so did the hospital thought it it, it uh, cured but it hadn't um, and like I said you know the water in Mexico is not great and it got in there and that's where I got it so I suppose from that time it would have been about five months mm. to, from, from, from the time of having the ulcer to the time of, of them cutting me to bits. Well, I'm glad to see you're still performing and kicking ass, but that's still oh, rough to go through. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it wasn't a very pleasant thing to go through, but it's, um, I still suffer with the PTSD a bit, but, um, I can imagine it's, uh, that's getting, day by day slightly better um my wife would probably disagree with me but 
because <laughs> I can lose my my temper at the drop of a fucking hat, you know, it's, and and for for no good reason. So that's you know, and I fight that, and uh, yeah. but I'm getting there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was it was literally me wanting to get back off on stage that drove me and it still does now you know i mean this this not being able to tour is killing me it's really horrible but yeah. you know yeah. i'd rather i'd rather do that than than be dead you know so for sure what is what would you say is the biggest obstacle live that you've uh, overcome since the surgery what's the hardest thing <laughs> Getting on a stage with no steps. <laughs> oh, that's, you know, I was thinking that. Oh, did you know what? I, I think there's, there's always steps, but some of them are um, uh, taller than others, so it's quite difficult. I mean, I can manage steps. It's not, not an issue. But uh, there was, there's one uh, in Canada called the Piranha Bar. I can't remember if it's Montreal. But anyway, I... Uh, uh, I have to literally uh, g get onto the stage on my stomach and drag myself on and then stand mm. up. <laughs> it's because <laughs> they've got no stairs and it's about 18 inches to two feet off the ground. So uh, there's no way I can manage to, to pull myself up in one hit on that. But yeah, stairs are the, are the major issue. I remember the first tour that we did after I lost my leg. I, I was moaning like a bitch uh, every time we came into a into a hotel a, a, a gig. There was fucking stairs, and it's just oh, I tell you, I just I used to fucking lose it. And I'm sure my band members were like, oh, he's fucking going off again. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but, but then then I had it was just like saying, well, there isn't any venue out there without stairs. And and I said, so what the fuck am I? moaning at so that was it i just quit that because there was no point in in uh, uh you know there, there was no way that we could ever find a venue that didn't have stairs in fact there is one and um uh, uh liquid joe's and there's no stairs to get in i can go in and out of the club no problem still got stairs to get up on the fucking stage so you know it's whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we get Steve some some a platform or something out there, guys? Like, it wouldn't be too hard. Like yeah, come maybe on. we could uh what was the what was the name of the club again? Liquid Joe's. Liquid Joe's. Come on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a great club to play, actually. But it's uh yeah, they're they're all difficult. Um and uh yeah like i say it was i i, I did moan like a bitch everything uh, uh, mainly stairs but you know in the in the grand scheme of things there's no way i can get away with that so or, or without uh stairs so that's the way it is you know and that's something that, that yeah if i want to do what i do i've got something i've got to put up with so i do so was there a uh, a specific tour from back in the day that sticks out to you where you played with some cool bands maybe you were a fan of or uh well we did I, I mentioned it earlier we did the texas jam back in 87 it wasn't a tour it was just a, a one-off show we, we played with uh deep purple scorpions night ranger ted nugent uh bon jovi and uh, and us yeah it was a fucking great show it was really really cool great you know it's like i say though getting ready to go on stage fortunately we we had a, a problem getting to the venue we were being picked up or be being picked up and the and the, the driver said oh, i'm gonna go around the back way uh, because the main routes in are getting like you know full up I was, yeah well yeah whatever you know you know better than we do. Anyway, right. he got fucking lost. <laughs> and um, we were going fucking round and round and round. And, and then we started noticing, like looking out the window, we just fucking passed that. So Nick, Nick, who's very nervous anyway, says, uh, says to the driver, are you fucking lost or what? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> and then he must have taken a different turn because we saw a, a police 
was not a police station. I don't know quite what you ha how you say, it, but it um, it's a police venue where where the guy lives in the house. You know, so it's the county sheriff or whatever. I don't gotcha. know. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So so look, go in there and ask this guy. So he goes in and he comes out with with the sheriff. And uh, the sheriff's got some albums in his hand. And he said, my kids adore you. Can you sign these? And I'll give you an escort all the way to the, to the stadium. So, <laughs> fucking sorted. Fucking give us that, sign that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so by the time we got there, we had 20 minutes to get ready to go on stage. So we didn't really uh, get the, the opportunity to sneak around and have a look at the crowd and everything. Now, I'm bloody glad we didn't because uh, when we got out there, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> it was just, you know, 83,000 people. I think the most we'd ever played to was 5,000 people. And uh, it was just like, oh, my God. Uh, I think the first two songs, my lips and my tongue, everything got stuck together. And <laughs> it, But then you start, you know, crowd started to react. And we, uh, it was a fabulous day. It really was. Great, great day. And uh, we... Uh, the next day we flew back out to or flew out of uh, Dallas to, to rejoin our tour. And um, as soon as we got onto the plane, people were like pointing and talking, you know, you could just, and then we realized that I think it was a Dallas Tribune or something like that had been placed on every single seat. And on the front page was us singing wow. to the crowd. So people were like, it's them, it's them, it's them. So, <laughs> Another claim to fame, but yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a great day. And, um, so that sticks out and I won't ever forget that. I mean, we've played with, uh, Uriah Heap we played with, uh, uh, not too many people, actually, not too many bands of, of, of we toured with, to be fair. Um, I think that's it really. Uh, did you ever tour with, did you ever end up touring with Priest? Priest, no, no. We were we were lined up to do that, and we were also lined up to do White Snake. Mm. Uh, in fact, all the tickets were printed and everything for that, um, and uh, it all fell through. It didn't come off. The, the tour didn't come off. Not just you know they weren't disappointed with us, but yeah, it was uh, yeah disappointed. I'd like to have done that. I've played with with those guys at stadiums uh, not stadiums at uh, festivals right but uh yeah it's uh, it's been it's been cool let's see you know like i could say i've not made any money at it i'm still owed money uh from the 80s by uh rca records i still haven't had a penny from there from from them still fighting that and uh but i'm happy you know i'm happy that i've done what i've done and i've still got the opportunity to carry on doing what i do so that's good yes sir now correct me if i'm wrong but did you guys uh record see you in hell in one take yeah that's oof. that's yeah. Major <laughs> impressive. Yeah. that that whole album took four days that's, that's a classic four, that's, four that's days to spit out a classic yeah four days i mean that's if you look at it there are a lot of holes in it but it's it is what it is That's it? Charm. And, and yeah yeah and i still try to to do that i still record that same you know the same way um it there's no electronic drums anything like that it is all you know instruments played together um because i, I think that's how you get the feel you know, lots of lots of young metal bands these days don't do that. You know, they do play to to um, uh, drum machines and stuff because they can't afford to go into the studio. And I get that, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's never going to sound. The yeah, same. you can tell. There's, it's yeah. just very thin. It's not. You don't get the yeah. feel from it. You don't get no. Especially with drums, because, you know, if you change the drum track on a song, it changes the entire feel of the song. So when it's it just does. all very yeah. clean and processed yeah. and very kind of empty, yeah. it affects everything. Yeah. And, it, and, and your band's got to be good enough to follow the drummer. And uh, it, because he, 
it, we record our stuff to click, but it's real drums played right. in real time. Uh, and you, you can hear it, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm mixing a live album of us at the moment, and, I, and the drummer still played to a click playing live. And that's, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a drummer myself, and playing right. to a click is one of the, the hardest things to do because, you know, if you're playing at a live show and there's no click or anything, you can kind of be a little bit fast, a little bit slow, the rest of the band will follow. But if you're playing to a click and you're off by that much, oh, yeah. it's noticeable yeah. and it fucks yeah. everybody yeah. up. <laughs> It does, but if they're good enough, <laughs> they will follow you. And, and that's the whole case. So, you know, say I'm listening to, because I'm, I'm mixing or have now mixed drums. And it's like you can hear him. You know, he's, he's still in time, but very fractionally off either side of the click. And, and you can hear it, but everybody else is with him. So it's just like, so you know, when you've got up. everything, it's just, you don't hear it, you know. But that's the charm and that's the... The, the 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 reason it sounds uh, 80s you know it's the it, it gives it that feel that thickness and that 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 well like i say the feel that's what gives it the feel definitely are there any newer metal bands that you got your eye on that you like listening to um I've got a few actually from from the new wave of British heavy metal days, uh, which that didn't do much in the back in the day. But uh, yes, there are there are a few new ones. Uh, there's a band in the there's a, a band called Neuron Spoiler, hmm. and that they are awesome. I'm gonna write uh, that yeah, Neuron Spoiler, check it out. Uh, and uh, who's the other one? Um, Oh, uh, Seven Sisters, another fucking awesome band. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, those two, those two, uh, another one called Toledo Steel. Oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware of that. Yeah, yeah. Now, th those three bands have supported me in, in and at various uh, venues. All great bands. Fantastic bands. Uh, and I think they've got it. Um, I actually mastered one uh, Seven Sisters album, and uh, the first time I heard it, I was like, "Fuck it, now this is good," and it just got better and better and better. You know, um, and uh, likewise for all the three bands I've just mentioned, they are they are a force to be reckoned with. I've got a recommendation for you, Steve, because uh, yes. it's a band called Riot City. I, I knew that's where that was going, too. And <laughs> they remind me of Grim Reaper, which is why I like them. And they, uh, I've actually reached out to, to them and had them on the podcast specifically because I found them and they covered See You in Hell. And I told him that he was the only, they were the only band that had any business covering that song because they had the balls <laughs> for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, uh, let me find a piece of paper. What was their name? Riot City. Right. Oh, right. Okay. They cover a, f a couple of your songs, and yeah. they have an album called In the Dark, which is ridiculous. Okay. Oh, it's awesome. Okay, new, I'll check that priest. out. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'll definitely check that out. Awesome. Yeah. So what are your top metal albums, Steve Grimmett's top metal albums? Oh... That's a difficult one because I was never always into metal, as, as I mentioned. Your favorite earlier. albums in general yeah. doesn't have to be metal. The, back in the day, it was Number of the Beast, I got to say. That was really cool. And uh, I liked Dio back in the day, but I got to say, I wasn't a huge fan. And then. About four or five years ago, I started listening to all his stuff. I've got his whole collection now, and uh, oh, the Grown the you. vocals are stunning. They really are, and they are not overreached. They they put you in. They create a story in your head about what's going on. Uh, well, he does, and it, the, the songs are so simple. That, and he's just so brilliant over the top of everything, you know. Um, and we do a cover of uh, Don't Talk to Strangers. And 
if I could come close to that, to, to how he did it, that would be great. I don't ever think, you know, maybe one or two nights I have, but, but just you know, that's a mark of respect from me to him by doing that, that song, you know? Yes, sir. I, I would put, I'd bet money that you're doing pretty damn good with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most people say that, but, it, it, but it's, it's, it's in my head that, you know, he's watching and it's just like, Oh shit, I didn't do that. And no, I didn't do that. No. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an honor to be able to tribute him entirely, you know, it's uh, cause he's missed and he still is so missed, you know, cause every time I announce that we're going to be doing a tribute and a Ronnie James Dio tribute, the, the kids go mad and uh, they absolutely love it and still love him. You know? So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Mitch, if you have nothing for Mr. Grimmett here, I'm going to be cutting him loose soon. So you got anything in the, in the bank? I mean, the, the only thing I really wanted to ask was there was about a, what, a, a 30 year gap between uh, Grim Reaper albums, correct? Something like that? 25, 20 ish. Oh yeah. Yeah. The what was it? Was something like that. Was it difficult getting back into the studio to, to put new Grim Reaper out or was it just kind of like, <laughs> I never <laughs> stopped. I never stopped. <laughs> Lots of people think I didn't. Uh, you know, I did stop, but I didn't. Uh, I was in a band called Onslaught uh, from the UK. Uh, thrash Act, actually. It, we were supposed to be Britain's answer to Metallica. Um, and I did a, an album with them called In Search of Sanity. And then I did, uh, I formed a band called Lion's Heart. And that was sort of, a blues based rock we did four albums with that with that band so if you want to check them out <laughs> i'm going to check them out yeah I'm, i've got those with uh neuron spoiler seven sisters and i already know yeah Chico still yeah yeah well, you, yeah, yeah. The, the lion's heart stuff i particularly enjoyed that's probably right up my street really but uh yeah lion's heart onslaught was not up my street but i enjoyed it and it gave me a stepping stone because like i said we did we'd done nothing in England and Europe until I did the onslaught stuff. Um, uh, so it was that and oh, what have I done anything else? I think I have, I, I've done a lot of bits and pieces on other people's albums. I'm, I'm on the, the new three tremors album as well. Um, so I've never stopped since leaving, um, or since since Grim Reaper split up to the time up to two thousand six, I've done shitloads of stuff. So never stopped. Never don't, ever stopped. Don't stop. Keep on keeping. Yeah, no, please. We want to no. listen. I, I I will. I love it, and I still love it, and I'm going to keep going. Uh, obviously, my my physical side will let me down before anything else I'd imagine, but I should still do albums and stuff and special appearances and stuff like that. But, you know, for, for the time being, I'm still going out there and I'm going to do what I do best. Yes, sir. And now before I let you go, do you have uh, Facebook, social medias? Or yes. All of those, Steve Grimm, it's Grim Reaper. You can find uh, um, all of those on uh, Facebook. Uh, so we've got Facebook, Instagram. I think Instagram is probably my personal one, but you can join in there anytime. All right, awesome. Steve. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure for me and Mitch. And Yes, sir. No we, problem. Uh, whenever you get the new albums done, we'd love to have you on to promote them. Okay, yeah, cool. that will be fantastic. Thank you. No problem. You have a great day. Have a wonderful day, yeah. sir. And you guys, take care now. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.